Good morning, Frontline. How are we doing in the room today? Good. It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. It's also good to have you if you're joining and watching online. Uh, question for you, just right at the top. Have you ever seen a parent go too far? Have you ever been a parent that went too far? Maybe that's a better question to ask. Uh, when I was younger, my first job ever was a soccer referee. And uh, it was fun for me. I'm like, this feels like I get to play, but I'm also in charge. You know, so I get to be out there with a whistle. And so I, I had a lot of fun. I was a soccer referee for U12. There's one tournament that I was doing. And I actually convinced my little sister to come be my assistant referee. So she was my sideline ref. Uh, that was a horrible idea. That was just not smart at all. I should have thought through it. She hated soccer, but like I pushed and pushed and pushed. I was like, come on, it'll be great. Like what could go wrong? So we're at this tournament, it's U12, it's a girls game, um, but for some reason you would have thought like we were in the Olympics. I mean, it was like, tensions were high, it's like this is game one of a tournament of 12 year olds. But this, this dad was out there, he was taking pictures, it was like he, he was it, and he was there for his daughter, and so he had you know, the fancy monopod and the DSLR camera with the giant lens, and so he's taking pictures and pictures, and so he's running the sideline like with my sister. It's just kind of weird. So the senior referee of the tournament is walking by and he's watching my sister and he's noticing like, I, I might just come hang out and like walk with her and help her out, just coach her a little bit. He could tell it was one of her first games. So he went out and there was this play that happened. So I'm in the middle, I'm the center referee. There's this breakaway that heads towards the opposite goal and offsides is a big deal in soccer. And, and it comes down to where somebody was placed when the ball was kicked. And so as the center referee, I couldn't see it. I was reliant on my sister and then this senior referee that was helping her. And so all of a sudden, the play happens. It takes place. And they're headed upfield. And all of a sudden, I see the center referee do this. He raises his hand straight up to signal offside. So what do I do as a center referee? I blow the whistle. I yell offsides. I'm jogging up to grab the ball. And the guy with the camera lost his mind lost his mind, threw his camera down, started screaming because apparently who we just called offsides on was his daughter. So he throws his camera down, he begins screaming, and he gets right in the senior referee's face and just starts ripping on him. I mean, just tell him, who do you think you are? You don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, I mean, to the point where I just like picked up the ball and I was like, we can wait, you know, because nobody else, everybody else wants to know what's going to happen, as do I. So I'm just waiting, trying to see what happens, and two parents from his team actually walk all the way around the field, and they come over to this guy. It's as if like it was their day, like the parents take turns, like who's going to wrangle him today. So they walked over, each grabbed him one arm, and they start dragging him away. And the last thing I remember him yelling at this referee, who literally just stood there like this and just took it all like a champ. The last thing this dad yells is, you're a disgrace. And I just sat there like, really? really? They're 12. They're 12 years old. Dragged him off. I mean, it was kind of funny. It was one of those experiences. My sister, I remember looking at her, and I'm like, she's never going to ref ever again. This was like the worst experience, and she didn't. I don't think she did. I think she was done at that point. But it, here's what made me laugh is like, you know, nobody on that day, nobody during that game questioned this dad's love for his daughter, right? Nobody questioned. Of course he loves her. And it doesn't have to do just with the fact that she's playing soccer. He just loves her. He felt like she was wronged and he wanted to speak up or fight on her behalf. No one questioned whether or not he loved his daughter. But for the purposes of today and where we're going, I think we should question maybe some of his parenting. This series is all about parenting, but it's not just for parents. It's for future parents. It's for people who won't ever be parents. It's for people who, who just love kids or have different kids in their lives, whether it's neighbor kids or family kids, nieces, nephews, grandchildren. It's about what are we sowing into the next generation? And what you'll find out as we dive in today that, that the, the purpose of this message actually affects and impacts all of us, not just parents. But for parents specifically, it will begin to speak to something that often I think we don't talk about very much. Because in our world, in our culture, whatever, I think a lot of times we elevate kids or we elevate our children to places and positions in our lives that they really shouldn't be in. And I know that's weird to say, and I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit more, but I had a mentor of mine, before I got married, I remember him sitting down and he said, David, marriage is going to be so good for you. I went, really? Tell me, sensei. Like, what, what's going to be good? And he goes, it's one of the most sanctifying processes a man can go through. 
Sanctifying means like you will become more like Jesus in the process. And I went, that sounds like a great thing. Sign me up. Here's what I didn't realize. It's because there's an undoing that is done when you're in a relationship like marriage with someone else that, that different things, different wounds, different tendencies, different levels of brokenness begin to surface over time. So here's what I love about this series is I think parenting is also one of those things. Nobody can undo me like my son. But I've learned a different level of God's heart for me through my son. Whether you're a parent or not, my hope and my prayer for you is that, that you'll lean in, that you'll understand God has something for all of us today whether you're a parent, whether you're not, whether you parent other people's kids or your own, whether you will be someday or not, God has something for us today, but parenting just happens to be the avenue for which we're talking about it today. So I'm excited for it. Let's jump in. This is Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, Paul is the author. Paul authored much of the New Testament Um, which is like the second chunk of your Bible. But Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. Saul traveled around. He persecuted Christians, persecuted, imprisoned, you know, uh, attacked, whipped, arrested, and killed people like us, followers of Jesus. So Saul went place to place to place to place to place. He saw it as his mission to personally stop what was going on. And then God actually got a hold of Saul's life in a pretty powerful way, um, which is why his name ended up being changed to Paul. And so Paul went from being one of the biggest opposers to Christianity to one of the most on fire leaders of Christianity. And we still read his stuff today. So we're going to read this. This is Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and it says this, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So Paul is getting at this thing that that we were created with a gap or with lack, that, that we lacked what is considered fullness. And often what we do is we run to different things or different places or different relationships to fulfill or take hold of or try to grasp what that fulfillness or like what that fullness actually is. And so what Paul is saying is he's saying the fullness that you desire is only found in the person of Jesus. That's it. The thing that you're looking for, the thing that you're grasping after, the thing that you desire most actually can only be found in Jesus. But for parents, many of us find it in our kids. Let me ask this question here. Um, It goes like this. What makes you feel valuable? What makes you feel valuable? If you had to journal this, if you had to set aside a day and you said, man, what, what makes me feel valuable to our world? Valuable to my family? Valuable to my workplace. What what makes me feel valued? Many of us would say, oh, my job, skills, talents. Maybe it's money, my ability to earn or provide or protect. Maybe maybe it's my stuff. Maybe it's relationships. But I, I think many of us, if we're honest, those of us with kids would probably say, my kids. There's something unique about the parent child relationship that that when they need you, you feel important. You feel valuable. You feel irreplaceable. It it speaks to this thing, and this is where we're starting to get dangerous. It starts speaking to places in my own heart, and I think many of us, that I can do for them what others or God can't do for them. That, That we begin putting them in a place that was never designed for them to sit. And honestly, what I think a lot of us do whether it's intentional or not, is we actually elevate our kids and our parenting because it makes us feel valuable. We elevate it to the point that our kids actually function like an idol in many of our lives. And it's dangerous. What is an idol? Let let me unpack it. Here's a super simple definition of an idol. It is something that replaces God. Something that replaces him. I've noticed this, uh, so I, I'm not going to try to convince you that I have all these parenting miles that I don't have. I don't. You know, we have one kid, he's almost three, and it's been a handful for me. We have another one coming, as many of you know, in December, and part of me is like, I know what I signed up for, but then anybody with multiple kids says, no, you don't. You have no idea what's coming. 
Now you're going to be man-to-man. That's what people say. Right now you're double-teaming. It's going to get worse. So I, I'm not going to convince you that I know what I'm talking about or that I know what it's like having adult children or, or children that are out of the house or middle school. I'm not going to try to convince you, but I do think there's a truth here that we can wrestle with, and that's this. Many of us idolize our kids because of how, it makes it, how, how they make us feel. We feel important. We feel needed. We feel valuable. Here, let me give you an example. When my son does something athletic, I feel proud. So I'm like, I helped do that. I create, those are my genes at work. Anybody else? When, when, when I see him like get musical and he starts playing and, and moving, I'm like, I did that. He got that from me. You know what I'm talking about? Like value, look at this. When he's smart, I'm like, yes, he got Shannon's genes. All right. Like, he's doing well. He's like, look at my kid. When I see him and, he, and he's friendly, he's sociable, he's lovable. When I see people love my kid, there's a piece of me that feels like I'm getting love because he's being loved. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's, it's like this, as they succeed, I feel like I'm succeeding, but the opposite is true. As they fail, I feel like I'm a failure. I feel like I'm, I'm dropping the ball. I feel like I'm behind. When I see other kids doing more than he is, you start taking it personally. You start wondering, is there something wrong with him? Is there something wrong with me? This is like indicative of an idol. When we elevate something that is not supposed to be in that place, we start deriving our value, our security, our identity, our fullness from things that are not supposed to be. They are called idols. So here's, here's the thing. I, I told you this already. I don't have a lot of miles as a parent, but, but in my role, especially over the last almost eight, nine years in ministry, I've walked with a lot of families, and I've seen a lot of the wreckage that comes from elevating kids to a position almost as an idol in their lives. Here's, here's some of them. Um, it actually breaks my heart. There's a lot of young couples that end up uh, struggling significantly in their marriage or end up filing for divorce early on, shortly after they have kids. I've just noticed that. I've noticed that in my spheres. I've noticed that in culture. Here's other ones. I've noticed a lot of blended families, even the last couple of years, struggling to merge two together, two families together. I've noticed a lot of middle schoolers trying to encounter, or not trying to encounter, but just, it's just, ta-da, here it is. They're encountering significant broken areas that they have to sort through, many of them on their own, many of them without even the knowledge of parents. Things like this, the LGBT conversation, trans, sexuality, pornography, sexual education. They're encountering things in schools right now that many of us, when we were in school, we didn't have to encounter. And that, that's true. Just look at that generation upon generation upon generation. They're, kids are being given more power and more authority to choose and decide and decipher, decipher and they're feeling pressure. And it's, it's having effects that are really detrimental to our culture. There's high schoolers where uh, this, one's, this one's difficult. There, there's a lot of parents that are allowing kids, particularly of high school age, to let them dictate the pace and standard and priorities in their life. And to a certain extent, they're going to anyway, right? Those of you, I, I was a child, okay? I don't need a child uh, who's a high schooler to know this. I was that child. At a certain point, I'm going to do what I want to do. But there's a way that God set up families, and there's a way he set up parents to shepherd and guide and decide for our kids, because often what we know best is is important whether they realize it or appreciate it or not. There's a lot of high schoolers right now that church is the farthest thing of a priority for them. And it's not even just church, it's, it's Christianity. It's a relationship with Jesus. There's so many high schoolers that want nothing to do with it because it hasn't been modeled in their life as the most important thing. And then this last one, this one actually hurts. Um, there's a lot of empty nesters whose marriages fall apart when their kids move out. And this isn't true just at Frontline. It's not just true on a big C church. It's, it's actually true like in our culture. There's so many parents that get to the end of raising kids that they look at each other and they go, I don't even know you anymore. Like I, I have those parents in my own extended family. I, I, I watch it happen. 
when we raise kids to the point that they become an idol, there follows a wreckage that it doesn't take a believer to see or take an account of. So this is why we're wrestling through. This is why it's so important. So Paul says this in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He's saying, let me just remind all of you, Jesus belongs in the number one seat of your life. That's where he fits. If you want your life to work, if you want it to function, if you want to have a wake of good things, of blessing that follow you, it starts with who you put in the driver's seat. And so what he's saying is that's Jesus. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, often we think we have to build our lives. And we have to cater to it or we have to select it like it's a buffet. And we go, I want to have a couple kids here and I want to do this and grow here and work here. He's saying Christ is your life. He's not a part of it. When he's number one, there will be a wake that we actually desire, but it's the only way to accomplish it. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The tendency is to not do this. The tendency is to just give in and let kids run it. Uh, I already told you this, Judah, my son, he's only almost three. Um, but he does this thing. Do your kids do this? I'm just curious. Where I'll be talking to like another human being, you know, who's right in the room, who's there, who's visible. And Judah will go, dad, 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 dad. And he'll grab my face. He'll grab my ears, grab my nose, stick his fingers. Like he'll do anything to get my attention. And I'll look at him and I'll go, what? And he goes, Lightning McQueen. <laughs> I know. It's been on for an hour. I know. And it's just like, oh, that's it. That's it. I just, I wanted a second. I'm Judah, right? I want a second just to grab your attention, to hold it, to fasten it, to make sure that you hear what I'm saying. It's more important than anything else. It's easier over time to start giving in because it's not worth the fight. It's easier over time just to go, you know what? Whatever you decide, I'm not talking to you about church again. Whatever you decide, go hang out with that group. I'm done with it. What, I, your problem. You decide, fine, work where you want or hang with your friends or watch whatever movie or what. It's like at a certain point, I think so many of us, in an effort to just stop the fighting and stop the demands, we just go, I'm just, you decide. And I'm here to tell you, if, that, if that's you or if you've done that, that, that's evidence of elevating your kids to a position of idol in their life because it removes Jesus from the driver's seat and it puts somebody else, including you. So this is why this is so important to talk about as parents. We don't just do this as parents. We do this just as people. There are other things in our life that clamor and attack us for, for our attention. Kids just happens to be the avenue that we're talking about it today. So here's, here's the problem, though. I realize I'm laying it on thick, okay? I realize that. But I think many of us as parents have really good intentions. I think many of us look at our kids and we say, I, I want to do for them what nobody did for me. I think many of us look at our kids and we say, how can I protect him or protect her in ways that I wasn't protected as a kid? How can I provide opportunities for them that I didn't have? How can I give them decisions in their life that I wish I would have had? How, often it's like we try to relive through our kids the brokenness of our own story. And it's dangerous. It's absolutely dangerous. Many of us have great intentions with our kids. But if we don't parent them the way that God has actually set it up, we can do damage and significant damage. So I want to ask you this question. The question goes like this. What is your measure of success as a parent? How do you know if you made it? How do you know if you win? If you had to take a day and just journal this, what is success? I bet many of us would come to this conclusion. First of all, when they're 18, they move out of the house. They're able to live independently. They make good decisions. They're healthy. Maybe they end up getting married. They buy a house. They live close. They produce a 1,000 grandchildren. All, what makes success to you as a parent? But I want to offer something. 
If they have everything that we just listed, if they have all of it, but they lack one thing, and that one thing is a healthy, vibrant, growing relationship with Jesus, was it worth it? They could be a superstar. They could be in the Olympics. They could be a rock star, travel the world. They could own their own business. They could be a world-renowned teacher, communicator, you, you name it. If they have all of it, but they lack the most important thing, do they have anything of value? If we remove Jesus from the driver's seat, that's what inevitably we will produce. It just is. We could teach our kids whatever we want, but inevitably we're going to reproduce who we are. Let's read this last part here. It says this in Colossians 3, verse 20. It says, children, obey your parents in what? Everything. All the parents should have spoke up on that one. So you're like, did you hear that? Did you write it down? You're going to look it up on YouTube later. You're going to clip it. You're going to send it to your kids. Yeah, it's in the Bible. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases who? The Lord. But you know what this implies? Parents, you're in charge. You are in charge. Not for your benefit. Not for your control, not for your power trip, not so you can be in, in demand mode. Parents, you are in control because you've been allowed the opportunity to steward the life of your child from God himself. So you're in charge. You're, in, you're, you're responsible. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. But fathers, substitute that to parents. Do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Everybody say this word, embitter. Embitter. Do you know what embitter means? I wanted to look this up just to give a full representation. Embitter, two other words that, that rise up as definitions of this one. One is exacerbate, like overwhelm, pressure, exhaust, like push. The other one is discourage or frustrate. It's saying when, when we put pressure on our kids and we put them in the role of the driver's seat rather than Jesus, we embitter our kids. That they may not be able to verbalize it, they may not be able to tell you, but they feel the pressure of the role of being in the driver's seat. And that's not where they're supposed to sit. So we can do damage if we don't get this right, but, but we do this like... I wrote down a couple things here. There, there are many people I know uh, who hate things from their childhood that their parents forced on them. There's so many people I know, uh, uh, or, or like kids, I was a resident assistant at Grand Valley, and it's like, you want to take a sampling of the American culture of parenting? Go be a resident assistant for 60 brand new freshmen. You'll be like, wow, this is a healthy dose of disappointment. Because it's like for the first time, they have no boundaries, no limits. They can do it, and it's like, pfft, they pop. Kids who got everything that they ever asked for, who have been in the driver's seat for their life, have so much more to overcome than those that were told no as kids. I've watched it firsthand. Or, or this one. I just said this. Our, our world is full of embittered, exacerbated discouraged children that never grew up. I think it happens when we put anybody else, including ourselves, in the driver's seat that belongs to Jesus. Let me offer this thought to you today. This is the main point. This is where I'm driving. The best thing that you can give your kids is a relationship with Jesus worth imitating. The absolute best thing the best thing you can offer, the best thing you can model, the best gift you could ever give your kids is a life that revolves around Jesus in your driver's seat. Notice, this, this almost has nothing to do with your kids. This is why I said you, you might not have kids. This still applies. The best gift you can give anybody is Jesus in the driver's seat of your life. Best thing you can provide work, the best thing you can provide your church, the best thing you can provide ministry, the best thing you can provide your family or your neighborhood is a relationship with Jesus that's worth copying. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he's up in front and he's looking at a group of 70 of his disciples. 
And he looks at him and he says, this, hey, I'm going to give you this command. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. He says, make disciples, but not of themselves, of him. The best gift we can give our kids is to live our lives as disciples of Jesus. So as, as I was thinking about this and even like working towards a close, I'm like, I need a story of like a perfect parent, right? Because the whole thing is called raising the perfect parent. I'm like, who's, who's, been, who's been close? I couldn't even come up with anybody close. I mean, isn't that funny? I, it's certainly not going to be me. It's certainly not going to be my parents. It's certainly not. It's like the more you start thinking, the more you start going, is this just a target we're all going to chase forever? And the answer is yes. There's one perfect parent, and it's God. I was talking to Steve. Steve's up here. He's helping lead worship, and he said, you remember that line in the movie The Shack? where this man asked God, and he goes, why, why do you have us call you Father? He says, because I knew you'd need a perfect one. That just hit me so deep. There, there is no perfect parent. You can never be the perfect parent, but you can run to who is. You can model what it looks like to, to just submit under the Father as his children. And it'll change everything. When we do, we're quick to forgive because we've experienced forgiveness for ourselves. When we do, we're generous because we've experienced the generosity of God. When we do, we're just full of love, just overflowing and abounding. And I mean, it just, just pours out because we've experienced the love of our Savior. The perfect parent is him. Our desire, our goal, the sanctification process we get to be a part of is to learn how to model our lives after him. So let me just say that phrase again. The best gift you can give your kids is a relationship with Jesus worth imitating. It's not the only gift, but it is the best one. Don't deprive the next generation of the best gift it could ever give. I'm just reminded of this as the band makes their way up. Now, our role as parents is temporary. It's a stewardship. Just like everything. I mean, Cody was up here talking about, you know, 10% that we give back to the Lord and then offering is above and beyond. Like it, what God gives us is it's all from him. We make the mistake sometimes when we assume I did this or I earned this or I own this. It's all his. It's the same with kids. We've actually been entrusted with what God values most, and it's his children. My children are his children. Our children are his children. We all are his children. So my desire for you, my hope for you today is that you will leave understanding it it's not my job to become or live out or develop into the perfect parent, but to teach my kids how to run to their perfect parent in him. And, it's, and we do that by modeling our own lives. So I have four questions I just wanted to leave you with today. This hopefully we'll tee you up for the rest of the series. We'll have four more weeks unpacking parenting. But question number one, it goes like this, have your kids or having kids become an idol in your life? One of the hardest parts in, in our lives right now with Shannon and I, it, we were both talking about it even this week, we're going, Bible time with Judah has, has dropped so far down the priority list because of everything else that goes on. You get to the end of the day and we go, oh, we forgot again, whoops, okay, we'll try again next, we'll try again next. If you follow that trajectory, we're gonna raise a child that doesn't believe that God's word is important because we've not demonstrated that's important to him. So, so have your kids become an idol in your life? Have you, have you allowed other things to be more important than the most important thing? Number two goes like this. Who sets the spiritual temperature in your home? Who decides what you do together in your relationship with Jesus. Number three goes like this. 
What role has Jesus played in your kid's life up to this point? What role do you desire him to play? And then number four, is your relationship with Jesus worth imitating? Maybe not. But what an invitation that we have on the table to say, today I want to make a change. Today, Jesus, I'm going to ask that you would step back into the role of driver's seat in my life. Today, I, I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to give, I'm, I'm going to surrender, I'm going to repent, I'm going to turn, I'm going to say, God, the, I've, I've pretended that these are mine and they're yours. Would you allow me to be shaped by you as their parent who loves them? so that I might be a representation of you. So you might change not just their lives, but the entire next generation for his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you, and a lot of us haven't done this well. A lot of us even just reflecting on our own lives, there's different things or different parts of our lives that we've allowed our kids to take control or we've allowed our jobs to take control or, we, or we've allowed money or wealth or vacation or friendships or, or just other things, other idols in our lives. We've allowed those to take your seat. So right now we just give it back. We just give it back. We say, Jesus, would you please sit on your throne in our hearts? Would you bring up things in our lives that need to change? Would you increase the value? That we need to find in you. Would you increase our desire for you? Our hunger for you? Our longing for you? Our dependence on you? Father, thank you for modeling what a father mother can really be. Even before we steward our kids, Father, allow us to steward our own hearts. To bring them before you, to submit to you. Father, would you speak to us as you do a child? Would you encourage us? Would you inspire us? Would you challenge us to be who you've created us to be? And then allow us to pass that on to the next generation. We love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.